Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Greg Murray, and I am the Director of Life Planning at Vistamar School in El Segundo, California, and I'm the Chair of the Data Trends and Analytics Committee. I'm really excited for today's DTA Today webinar titled Experiential Learning, Internships, and Summer Programs, Tracking, and Impact on College Admissions. So this could not be a more timely conversation. I was sharing with Emmy and Janet before that I spent about 30 minutes on the phone with an anxious ninth grade mom worried about what to pick for a summer program, whether or not it was worth the investment, how it would impact college admissions. And I'm sure we're all in those conversations every day as we see these deadlines for summer programs um, happening throughout this month. So today we've brought together a panel of experts who have different experiences with summer programs, um, research on it, and just uh, a wealth of knowledge to share with us from their vantage point. So at this point, I would usually turn it over to a moderator, but for today, that's going to be me. So I'm pleased to welcome our panelists and share a little bit about them. First, we have Jose, Jose Garcia, who is the Associate Director of Admissions for Diversity and Access at Rhodes College, located in Memphis, Tennessee. He's been in college admissions for 11 years and prior to that worked as a college football and college track coach for 13 years. He was a first gen low income student born and raised in Los Angeles, California, and is the child of an immigrant mother from El Salvador. Next, we have Stephen Cedarquist, who's a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan School of Information. Steve studies college admissions as a complex information system. That is understatement of the year. Um, his work, current work, examines how college admissions officers come to understand and utilize non-academic achievements in the holistic review process, and prior to his graduate studies, he served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Albania, where he helped students navigate the American college application process. And last but not least, we have Janet Weller, the Director of College Counseling at Harpeth Hall School in Nashville, Tennessee, who has over 20 years of experience in college counseling at girls' schools in Tennessee and Maryland. She predated me and served as the chair of the Data Trends and Analytics Committee for Access from 2017 to 22 and remains a member of the committee. Janet is also on the faculty for the NACAC, leading a dynamic college counseling office pre-conference workshop, coordinates the girls' school College Counseling Forum in collaboration with the International Coalition of Girls Schools and formerly served on the Potomac and Chesapeake ACAC as a member of the current Trends and Future Issues Committee. Janet, you're giving me tongue twisters with all of those titles. Um, so just as a, a disclaimer, we will always be recording our webinars and those will be made accessible to our membership through the Access YouTube page after the webinar concludes and within a few days. So if you haven't already, please do subscribe to that channel. There's lots of great content beyond DTA today. There's also data wonk throughs and past presentations that are definitely worth a look. So let's kick things off. Um, I've shared a little bit about your professional backgrounds, but could you each go through and sort of tell us about yourself and how you connect with experiential learning, internships and summer programs, the topic of today's discussion? I can jump in first. So a little bit about my background, again, being involved in college admissions, um, specifically in the realm of DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, and that's been a big part, especially when you look at programming for summer programs where you look at first gen, low income and or students of color, getting them on college campuses. We're also looking at internship opportunities for our applicants in the application pool when we're seeing students that are doing a variety of things across the board and how we as selective, uh, being at a selective school and having worked at super selective to much more access available schools, just seeing the, you know, what impact that has in the admissions process in terms of various schools using that as a major, sometimes a minor factor, but also the fact of seeing how this has helped in terms of students' growth. Um, we look at it from the, you know, from the DEI perspective, especially from a student that comes from an underserved population, for their chance to do a summer program, how their success rate can jump up even more higher or get much more the better chance to be successful because they've had that experience prior to getting to college. Right. Great. Thank you. Steve, would you like to jump in next? Sure thing. Um, 
So I'm coming at this obviously from less of a professional perspective. So I can I can talk about my personal experience as a student, um, which I think is a lot different from what students today are experiencing. Um, I grew up in a rural community, about 2,000 people on a good day. Uh, middle income family, but for me, what was uh, important was working. So like as uh, a student, um, when it came to experience, uh, I had to go out and find a job. And it, it was less because of a motivation um, to use it as a lever to communicate my uh, ability to succeed in college. And it was more of a, a necessity, right? Um, whether it's saving for college or being able to buy clothes for myself for the new school year and, and whatnot. Um, but I mean, looking back on it, what I recognize is that there are a variety of experiences that students can do that can communicate, um, you know, their potential success. And it, it just doesn't have to be narrowly defined as, you know, experiential summer learning programs. It can be a wide variety of things uh, as long as it's, you know, communicating maybe a core set of, of personal and uh, intellectual attributes. Great. Thank you. Janet? Um, well, uh, uh, as Greg shared already, I, um, I am a member of the Data Trends and Analytics Committee and former chair, and so I was originally set to moderate this panel, but <laughs> as we were talking about our various experiences with um, uh, immersive learning beyond the classroom, um, what is on offer at Harpeth Hall really touches on a lot of the different areas that we um, were discussing as, as a group as we were planning this webinar. Um, and I'll say more, uh, I'm sure, later about what some of the specific programs are that, that Harpeth Hall offers. I think they probably mirror a lot of the types of programs that our, our member schools uh, across AXIS also have in some capacity. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm coming at the panel from the perspective of a college counselor trying to work with students through what we already offer as an institution and what may be available during the summer or um, outside of school um, and trying to formulate the best advising plan uh, that, that I can and, and that we can as, as college counselors in order to help our students both to the college door through admissions, but then also, um, uh, you know, speaking to, to Steve's work and research through the college experience and into the world of work as well. Right. We're hoping not just to prepare them for college, but get them all the way through to be successful citizens and contributing. So it's not just about this, uh, this next step. Um, so that being said, how can students more effectively utilize their time beyond the classroom to create purposeful experiences that positively impact both admissions and the campus they get to? This is sort of the, the crux of the question. It's the, the thing that's most on parents' minds, but what's, what's your take on it? Steve, why don't we go with you first? I'm going to put you in the hot seat because you're looking okay. at this. Your arc and your research is really seeing that success measure mm -hmm. beyond just the the next stage. Fortunately, I'm standing, so the seat's not too hot. <laughs> uh, so how can students more effectively utilize their time beyond the classroom? Um, well, I mean, I'm reluctant to list off, you know, a check a list checklist of things that students can do that might be communicate high value to an admissions officer or maybe a future employer, uh, because I really don't think that there is a checklist um, that just anybody can go to. It, it really has to be rooted in that idea of purpose. When you say, how can they uh, create pur purposeful experiences? So a lot of it just begins with self reflection and um. I I often get and I often sometimes give a, a little bit of pushback on this because I'm a little bit concerned with the idea that we're continuously asking younger and younger and younger people to really think about their purpose in life. And really childhood is about that. It's about figuring it out. So if I really did have a recommendation, if I could boil it down to one thing, it would be taking a lot of time to think about what 
has purpose for students. And, you know, if they're going to do anything to help themselves, it's going to be talking to people. It's going to be talking to their advisors. It's going to be talking to friends. It's going to be most likely talking to their, to their, you know, their caregivers, whether that's their mother, their father, or someone else in their life. So I really think it begins there. Thank you. I, I agree with you, Steve. I think that the there's no cookie cutter person. I always tell when we look at these, we're taking away, like you said, see, we're taking away the the bits of childhood from these from these students. Um, yeah, uh, we always talk about having a passion for what you're doing. So really, seeing let let these students do something that they're passionate, that they're interested in, and not doing something based on the belief that this is meeting the quote unquote checklist in mm -hmm. order to meet these criteria needed in order to, you know, be put in this certain profile, this certain stratosphere that you feel will put you in a higher talk about admit rate at a certain selective school. Absolutely. I, and if I could add to that, um, my experience talking to, and I've lost my train of thought here a little bit. Um, I think admissions officers and also like employers at the end of the day, what they're really looking for is that you engaged in something for a good reason, like for a reason you were motivated for it, motivated, <clears throat> you know, beyond just like it being uh, a tool to accomplish something, right? I, I'm, there's a better word for it. Um, so I would say like, if anything, spend some time trying different things too. Uh, so don't get discouraged if one thing students can do is like not to get discouraged if they start something and they find out, you know, this doesn't really seem for me. Uh, uh oh, now what am I going to do? I'm running out of time. Like there is time and it's a process. And, and what's really going to be important in their applications is being able to communicate that it was a process of kind of figuring these things out. Um, and I think admissions officers and maybe less so employers will recognize, you know, the cognitive and also like the inter interpersonal uh, like tools that students need to be able to reflect and understand those things. Yeah, I think in, in, in my advising with students um, across the four grades where we have them, um, my colleagues and I tend to lead in the earlier years with curiosity as the driver. So like, what are you curious to know more about? What would really excite you to learn or experience hands-on? Um, and, and we try to engage students in a variety of ways to explore those interests. As they move through the grades though, it sort of becomes a little bit more focused on what would you like more enrichment in? So what are the things that are driving your thought process as you develop an idea of what's, you know, like what are, what are you crystallizing around as a, as a core area of interest for you? And how can you do more with that? Like what would excite you more to do with that? And, and then, you know, it is our job in college counseling to help the students to tell their story as a part of the admission process, um, but we sort of, and to varying degrees are successful, want to reverse engineer that. Like, who are you and what have you done that explores your curiosity and enriches you personally? And when, where therefore are the colleges that fit that rather than what am I gonna do in high school to make myself prepared for this specific institution? <laughs> And Janet, you made me laugh talking about reverse engineering because I have had students that feel like there's some sort of strategic plan when we reverse engineer, but really what we're doing is walking them through self-reflection and they're putting the pieces together, but it feels like there's some advantage to that because they're getting the help to walk through it. But it's the essence of what we do is to to find those little acorns that have been dropped and, and sort of bring it all together and see what it looks like. Um, so Steve, could you go into a little bit more detail on your research? Sure. Um, you've got such a rich background in analyzing what it is that employers are looking for. And I think we also have a lot of students that because of this creep of starting things earlier, they're actually doing internships. They're out there getting jobs. They're forming startups. So I yeah. connect to this. So the long picture of it is, um, 
the work that we're doing, the work that I do with my two advisors is uh, we really hate grades. Uh, at least my advisor really hates grades. And there's a number of reasons why um, we feel that way. And, and they're like empirically known. I mean, uh, grades, I guess the root of it is like what employers are telling me and they're, what employers are also telling colleges that they're looking for in students is not necessarily what we're tracking in, in colleges and universities. We're really tracking performance within coursework. We're measuring time and seat. We're measuring performance based against a, um, a perceived sense of what is typical, what is average, uh, when in reality, what they're looking for is a much richer array of skills and abilities. Most of them are not academic. Um, a lot of them feel like they can do a lot of the training uh, for students once they get into the job. Of course, that's going to be different for different professions. Like, I don't want my doctor being trained on the job when they show up. I would like that to happen at school. Um, but I mean, with that being said, uh, what we're trying to do is to figure out ways to document uh, a broader array of, of, of the learning that's happening in schools. So we're trying to innovate on the academic transcript. And our hope is that by creating this artifact, this academic transcript that is able to capture and track a broader array of not just cognitive, but also, you know, those interpersonal and those intrapersonal learning outcomes that students will understand um, the significance and the importance of the, them. And they'll also start to focus on, on ways that they can improve in those areas. Uh, and in the long run, hopefully that will uh, like improve their chances in terms of how they communicate what they're able to do to employers. It, I, I, I do think there is something to be said for internships that start really early on. Um, I know that as a kid, I was really interested in the medical profession. I thought I wanted to be a doctor. I would be a doctor, but not the type I thought it would be. Um, but like, if you have, I think this is just one really good example. Like if you are really interested in the medical profession as a, a, a like a high school student or even earlier than that, because it is such a huge commitment, it makes a lot of sense to invest that time into figuring out if that's really what you want to do with the rest of your life. Um, but if you're not interested in, in, in being a doctor, if you have maybe a little bit of uncertainty or your, your, your plans are a little bit more general, then I, I would argue that there's probably a, a little less uh, impetus to start early on. And also your experiences can be a lot uh, broader. Like what you're really looking for is just some general experiences with things like collaboration and teamwork and being able to communicate uh, well with your your supervisors and things like that. Mm -hmm. Well, so that's what employers are looking for. Jose, <laughs> what is it that you're looking for in the admissions office? And also, I we talked about this during the pre-planning meeting, but mm -hmm. this idea that there are so many admissions officers who are fresh to the profession. It's been a while since they went through high school. Things have changed. And we all know on the high school side that when a student puts something on their activities, that might be a huge and significant um, area of involvement for them, but it may not translate across to a green reader or somebody who doesn't quite understand how that all shakes out in the school day. How do you train your staff and how do you evaluate students in that sense so that everybody has the, the opportunity for access? No, that's a great question. I think, first of all, we, I'm touching this from the selective college um, perspective. When you look at schools now in the world we're in, where we're talking about admit rates now that are 40%, we're a 40% college, but I've worked in institutions that have been 15%, um, have been 3%, you know, things of that nature. You, you're you looking for ways as a college to differentiate students, to be able to determine, you know, you know, kind of selectivity and everything from that point. Um, we always talk about, and Jen, I love what you talked about in the beginning about curiosity. You know, we want to see that curiosity from those students in these internship qualities. You know, we want to see them in these ex in, in these entrepreneurships, these uh, these things they're doing outside the classroom, because that curiosity is going to impact our communities on our campus. I think that is huge. It's going to impact not just campus community, but also 
surrounding community, you know, for us in the city of Memphis, you know, Steve, you mentioned about the medical profession and be involved in that. They're going to be, those students will impact our community with St. Jude's, with Le Bonner, with those types of organizations in terms of helping them, improving them, but also giving them new workforce after that. I think the big thing that we're looking at in terms of these um, internships opportunities that students are taking is really the passion that they're having from that, because that's going to show us the passion, but also consistency. I think that's a big thing that we are missing nowadays. And I think something we're looking at admissions is consistency. When I train my staff, I am now not to age myself when I graduated in 1995 um, from high school and I was coming through high. I mean, I was a athlete and that's all I did. And it wasn't one of those factors, but now as we go through the process, you know, for both, you know, Greg and Janet, you guys are seeing the students right now is the, it's not just the, the, the need from the students, the need from the parents to think that they have to do that, but knowing that, you know, qu the, the old term quality versus quantity, knowing that, Hey, one is good or two is good. Seven doesn't need to be that far out. I think that's where we as admissions officers are training me and as a leader in our office are training our young staff to understand, look at time, look at how much effort they put into that, not the seven internships they did, but maybe that one that was over X amount of time, or the fact that we've seen a pattern of them doing this certain type of internship, knowing that this is the field that they may be going into. So teaching our young officers to really see quality, not see quantity. And I think that's a big thing for us, but also understanding and, and um, Greg, you talk about, we talk about relationships. We talk about everything of that nature, understanding that, for students, the relationship piece is key to us. So maybe getting that recommendation letter from that person that you did the internship with will give us more insight into who they are across the board. So I think that's massive there. So really going from that aspect, I, ho I hope that kind of answers the question right there. Yeah, no, that's perfect. I, I talk about this often with my students and we just had our ninth and 10th grade nights and I was suggesting the book Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less to families that were coming to me saying, what can we do to add more? And so I challenged them to sort of think about the bandwidth of their student and to your point, the quality over quantity. Um, so as students, are students more likely to gain access to college through summer experiences and persist once on campus? Steve, this might be a little more in your wheelhouse, but um, how is that showing up through students' experiences staying, their rates of attrition, um, just the the overall landscape. There's so much research dating back to Vince and Tinto about how involvement drives persistence. So do you care to tackle that one for us a little bit? I, I mean, I can, I can try. I am familiar with Tinto's work. Um, I think we're moving a little less away from his idea of the leaky pipeline and looking more into seeing these things as as pathways and understanding that like progress uh motivation is it's both socially and culturally uh constructed so you know progress uh persistence is is not just a matter of the individual's personal attributes it's also a matter of you know things that are going on in their life in their home life um and and things like that um I I don't have any real firsthand knowledge or of like like seeing how students are coming in with these experiences and comparing them to students who do not have those these experiences. I think if I were to take a stab at what it's what these experiences are probably doing is they're maybe be affirming in the student that yes, this is the path that I want to be on. So when it comes time for them to to go to college, uh, and maybe they meet adversity for the first time, I know especially with like highly selective institutions, this happens a lot. You know, students are always they're the growing up. They're always they've been the best at everything, uh, and then they get to a community where they are one among you know the best. Right? You know what I'm saying? Um, so when they do experience uh, adversity, maybe for the first time, it's nice for them to, ha to have these experiences that they can reflect on that maybe taught them lessons about how to either get through these challenges, or like I said, it, it just maybe reaffirms that like, even though I'm experiencing a little bit of adversity right now, 
I know I'm on the right path and that'll be, and that's helpful for them. Great. Thanks, Steve. Mm -hmm. um, so we did have one question in the chat that I'm going to jump to now, and then we'll actually turn over to Janet to talk about some of Harpeth Hall's offerings. Um, but just for the, the group, how are you just, or, and probably more Jose, how are you discerning between pay to play programs and those where students are truly learning something? Um, and this is a really good question. There are some expensive programs that do offer great quality and value. And there are some that just are bringing in big speakers and maybe that's not resonating with the students. It's not experiential, it's not interactive enough. Um, Jose, do you care to answer that on the move for us? And oh, you're on mute. Apologize, but I'm currently on the move. I was trying to find a space, but I'm currently at a program. Act, speaking of that, I'm currently at a program um, at a school in Washington, D.C. Um, but no, with the the ability, I look at that, and especially in the world of DEI, we want to be accessible, we want to give equal opportunity. Um, we, as admissions officers, and I can speak to this, I am on a couple committees nationally um, in terms of access, availability, um, and this always comes up is the pay to play, the ability for some families who are well resourced or the ability to have that to do these very renowned programs. But then we have my background being a first gen low income student from inner city Los Angeles, you know, not having access to that or maybe doing a program that's not as robust. Um, the world of admissions has really gone into the fact of looking at the program and seeing what's offered, but understanding where that student is coming from, really knowing that some of some of these uh, students that are being that are producing these programs, knowing the resource capabilities they have. And I think that's a major thing to be able to know the difference. I think that's something that in the world of admissions, and I know um, both Greg and Janet, you guys have you know been through, heard these talks and everything of that nature, but really seeing the, keeping the level playing field as much as we can, having that aspect from there. I think that's the big thing is we need to keep this level playing field across the board. We know the have, I hate saying this, the have and have nots, but we also know that students' resources can be limited based on geographics, based on location, based on you name it. And that's out of the controls of uh, out of the control of the students' hands. And that's something that admissions has really worked hard over the years to keep that level playing field. Yeah. There um, there are emerging tools that are helping um admissions officers understand these things. One is the um forgot exactly what it is, but more or less what it is, it's an environmental context dashboard. Um, so it, I think it's called Landscape. It's provided by yeah. the college board. Yeah. So it, you know, it's, it provides some baseline information about a student's community and it's all based on uh, zip code. But even like using zip code can sometimes be problematic. I mean, if you look at a, a city like Washington, DC, where there are multiple zip codes and, you know, going just by that single metric doesn't really give you a true measure of of you know what's going on in the student's life so that's that's kind of what i'm trying to do in my work is try to figure out and unpack this idea of like how do admissions officers actually contextualize the opportunity to to engage in extracurricular curricular activity um and i do like i i think the college board i think these other uh companies or businesses whatever nonprofits that provide an infrastructure for students to apply. I think they're aware of this and they're trying to build uh, the students, the tools for students to be able to communicate a wider array of, of learning experiences. I think for one thing, like the college board is putting a little bit more emphasis on uh, applicants and students talking about what they do in their, their home, right? So, you know, if you don't have uh, summer learning experiences, you can talk about you know, the work that you do to, you know, maybe taking care of younger siblings or taking care of uh, like an older adult and things like that. I, I do like that. I applaud that. Yeah. Um, and I'll touch real quick on landscape real quick for those that was mentioned. Um, it is a tool that has been brought up in the world of the Supreme Court decision where race and ethnicity has been taken off the board. Um, we needed other tools to help in identifying students, but also seeing where they're coming from, from both the academic setting and from the personal or geographic setting. So in landscape, um, it actually gives us information on neighborhood and school resources. Um, and this is prior to um, the SCOTUS decision. It was used by a few couple hundred schools, but then after that, it's now used by close to a thousand schools. 
So really a chance to be able to see that from, from there. Um, before we move on to the next question, Jose, just to follow up in the, the Q&A. So for students that do have the resources, perhaps that's in, indicated on the landscape, are colleges expecting that they have a higher or more impressive uh, list of credentials? Are there things that they expect to see on that student's profile? Not at all. No, no, no. I mean, that's something I think that even with the well-resourced school, the well-resourced student, um, we're not expecting that. We want them to, again, quality, the quality versus the quantity. Um, but we also know that every child is different. Every student is different in terms of what they want to do outside the classroom, but also the introvert versus the extrovert, you know, the student that's going to be the go-getter versus not the go-getter. There's no penalty for being who you are. And I think that's something that, um, that a lot of people have to understand that we're not going to penalize them, even though you come from a background that may have more of the resources. Great. Thank you. So now we're going to turn to Harpeth Hall. Janet has shared that they do some pretty cool programs that foster experiential learning opportunities that get students talking about careers and in different industries. So Janet, do you want to share some stories and, and experiences sure. with the school community and how that's playing out there? Sure, absolutely. Um, at Harpeth Hall, we've really tried to prioritize having opportunities for um, experiential learning, um, you know, just uh, giving students an immersive experience that goes beyond what they're doing in the classroom um, in sort of co-curricular ways. And we do that through a variety of avenues. Um, and I, I I'm speaking on behalf of Harpeth Hall, but I think these are representative of what exists at a lot of our member schools too, and in, in, in various formats and designs. Um, there are more initiatives at my school and at other schools, I'm sure, than what I'm gonna uh, what I'm gonna highlight today. But um, I want to talk about three programs that we have at Harpeth Hall that I think, um, you know, sort of serve as our, I guess, antidote to the pay to play. Uh, offerings. Um, and the first that I want to mention, um, because we're actually in the midst of it right now, it, it's our largest co-curricular initiative, and that's our winterim term. Um, so Harpeth Hall has a mini master between first and second semester, which occurs over three weeks in January. Um, and we've actually just celebrated our 50th anniversary with the program. Um, and uh, it, what happens is that every January for three weeks, um, ninth and 10th grade students are engaged in enrichment classes. Um, some of them have more of an academic focus like democracy and media, or um, we have a course called Med School 101. We have a course on marine biology. Um, so uh, academic pursuits, but not what's taught during our, our typical term. Um, and then some of the courses are sort of offbeat and delightful, like um, this year we did uh, a class on drumming and one that was a deep dive into denim where they, they actually went to a denim manufacturer and uh, learned about the dyeing process and um, and uh, they didn't get jeans. That was my first question was like, did, did you get jeans? They didn't. Um, and then we have a, a perennial favorite that we call how to find a stud, which uh, teaches basic household maintenance skills. And at the very end, they do a very brief lecture on dating and relationships. <laughs> Um, and at the same time that our, our ninth and 10th graders are engaged in those classroom activities, our juniors and seniors are um, participating in academic travel or internships. Um, this year, our students traveled to Italy, Spain, France, and England. They're studying art, culture, literature, innovation, um, and of course, language immersion. Um, in those countries, our interns worked with companies in Nashville and across the country um, or participated in job shadows. Um, and the students are responsible for processing what they're experiencing. So they journal about it, they'll present when they return. Um, and they also often write about the value of these exploratory weeks in college essays. There was a question I saw come into the Q&A about like, can we reflect a student's passion in our letters of recommendation? Um, for sure, that these are these are programs and opportunities that we talk about when we're when we're speaking about our students in the college process uh, through our letters. 
Um, and I, I've worked at two other schools where there's a similar offering to this that might take the shape of maybe a senior capstone or senior project experience in the final weeks of school too. So um, ours happens to be in January, but I know of other schools that do something similar at another point in time. And the other two programs that I thought I would mention um, are, are uh, during our regular academic term, um, our Global Scholars Program and our Honors STEM Research Program. Uh, Global Scholars is an ungraded academic program, um, and students are admitted by application. Um, and this is a program that pushes students to think beyond more familiar geographic and cultural boundaries um, to develop leadership skills for effective and responsible global citizenship. Um, students apply and begin as sophomores and are engaged in small group discussions. In junior year, they lead the small group discussions. And then as seniors, they prepare a capstone project on an area of particular personal interest and global import. Um, they, they research it throughout the year. They present at the end to a panel of students, faculty, administrators. There's often even board members that come to those presentations. Um, around 20 students, give or take, are selected each year for Global Scholars. It's, and and, and uh, at Harpeth Hall, that's about like a fifth of our class. Um, and then Honors STEM Research is a, um, that is actually something that would appear on a student's transcript at Harpeth Hall. It's another by application program um, that is a partnership and mentorship research program in conjunction between Harpeth Hall and Vanderbilt University, which is right up the road from us. Um, it appears as a weighted course on our transcript at Harpeth Hall Honors and AP receive weight. Um, and this is marked as an honors course. Juniors or seniors are admitted um, and then they participate in, in um, authentic research that's being conducted at undergraduate and sometimes even graduate levels at the university and they're supervised by a university professor. Um, so by the end of this, many students will have a byline of published research by the end of their, their time uh, researching with the professor. Um, and and so these are these are things that I loved the question about what if you are a well resourced school, um, do you are you are students expected to take advantage of of opportunity, um, and we as counselors at Harpeth Hall try really hard to point students in the direction of these types of enrichment if they align with areas of passion. So we're not expecting that a student who isn't guided by a deep desire to explore neuroscience is going to do STEM honors research, an internship in fashion design, uh, a, a, you know, a global scholars program on, you know, the war in the Ukraine. We would probably look for that student to focus their energies on applying to and being admitted to the honors STEM research program so that they can further their passion in their particular area. Do we have kids who do it all? Yes, I think that's probably true at all of our institutions. Um, but we really tried to develop these experiences for the personal enrichment of the student. And then, as I, as I mentioned earlier, try to um, guide them toward colleges that will continue to allow them to explore that passion further down the line. Awesome. Um... So Janet, you've sparked some questions in the chat. Um, one of the was <laughs> uh, do you offer AP courses at Harpeth? And how do faculty feel about quote unquote giving up three weeks of teaching time? Ah, um, okay. There is not a give up here. Um, so so this is this is um protected time. So the students aren't pulled out of class to do this. This is a, it's a mini semester that falls between our two semesters. So we will still have a full second semester term um, starting next week. Um, is that, we do yeah. offer AP courses. Yes. I can't remember. Did you say if that was required for students or was that the one that was apply application based? Which Winterham? Okay. Winterham is, is for all students. It's, it's a part of our regular school year. Okay. Great. Um, well, thank you. I have some ideas to bring back to my school, I think. Um, so building off of that, um, a few years ago, I was I attended South by Southwest's online conference and 
came back with all sorts of ideas. But one of the topics of conversations that was going on there and continues across a lot of industries is this idea of upskilling. How are we going to get students to upskill with the emergence of AI and things that are moving faster than our curricula can keep up with? Um, how is that? How can we encourage that? Should we expect it? And how is it playing out on the college side when it comes to admissions? Uh, I'll talk about it from here. Um, it is true. We it is hard to keep. I, I think it's hard for students to. I, we've had students that have said, "Oh, because of the AI world and chat and everything of that nature, they feel that they need to keep up." We're telling students, uh, honestly, we are telling students to do as much as they are capable of doing and how much they can handle. Um, we also look at it from that point of having access to that though. It, it, it depends on where the student is at in their research, research capabilities, resource capabilities um, in terms of being able to maybe touch on an internship or an extracurricular related to the AI world or things of that nature that are brand new to this world. So honestly, in the admissions world, it is not, it, it's great to see but we know it's sometimes far and few between because of accessibility, but also the ability to find those different internships within their regional locations. Yeah, those internships, that that term alone is tricky. And I try to discourage my students from even using it proactively when they're reaching out to folks in different industries because it, it becomes a, a wall or an obstacle for labor laws, for points of confusion for employers. And shadowing seems to crack the door open wide enough for an informational interview. But the second internship comes up, they are stonewalled and conversation stops at so many of the places that my students have been looking. Um, does anybody else want to add anything to that last? I, yeah, I would like to add just to the idea of, of upskilling and how artificial intelligence will play into that. I think. I mean, one of the fundamental premises of the work that I do is that the world is in some way fundamentally different than it's been in the past, which, I mean, you could argue that it's it's not. Um, one way of looking at that is, is just the, like the repeated, like how rapidly things change now. And I think with artificial intelligence, we will see that. Um, I would caution against students thinking that certain skill sets or knowledge are not worth understanding. I mean, what I mean by that is like, artificial intelligence is likely to modify how you go about doing things. It's not necessarily going to make certain skill sets not important. And like, I, I think as like an easy example, you could just look at statistical analysis. I think like the software programs that we're going to be able to develop with artificial intelligence are gonna make that type of work a lot more accessible to people but at the same time you have to understand uh some of the fundamental concepts behind statistical analysis and and you know what you need to uh understanding what you want to know and in that way understanding what you want to ask the artificial intelligence to to have you to do so i guess what i to boil it down is just to not think of uh of upskilling as like okay well now i need to have a different set of skill sets it's just now maybe I need to think about this a little bit differently and how artificial intelligence might come into play. And I think the, the, the place where anybody, not just students, like anybody can start is there's a lot of uh, really good and interesting free online uh, courses that will give you a very basic introduction, a very thorough but basic introduction um, to just the fundamentals of how specifically generative artificial intelligence programs actually work. Yeah. And... There are There's a lot tutorials. There's mm -hmm. so much information out there. There's prompt sheets and um, what have you. So there's lots out there and definitely opportunities for us to upskill as counselors too. Um, we had one other question in the chat that I wanted to address. Um, somebody said, and maybe this is for my own purposes as well. So my school is asking me to identify these types of opportunities for our students. Are there any resources available where I can direct students to find internships and passion projects? And I relate. I feel like I do my Google search, I do my due diligence, and I come up with the same list of five or 10 places that are inaccessible or just not going to work for some reason or another. And it, it's a 
it's a bear to try to figure out how to organize it, coordinate it for your students and put together just a cohesive list. So do you all have places that you go or actually maybe this is a good chance to use our chat. If anybody has resources or links that they'd like to share out, um, let's throw those in the chat and then we'll have our panelists talk to any of their go-tos or thoughts on this. So one thing that I have seen over my time is honestly our career and counseling centers or our, our offices of that nature, sharing it with the local high schools, be it um, be it public, private, whatever the case may be. Um, an example for us in Memphis, Tennessee, we have great connections to St. Jude's, FedEx, AutoZone, International Paper, you name the organization. We will pass these contacts over to our high school colleagues um, because we know that these students, that they're, these organizations, these nonprofits are looking for industry younger. They're looking for that person they can connect to at a younger age because we know that in time, they will build a relationship with them, and maybe over the next five, 10 years, they might come and work for them. Um, but that's one big area for us is really sharing our contact. And this is a big thing that we've seen um, in my time now in admissions and actually in athletics is our career services office is um, actually presenting to local high schools and local parents. I think that's a massive thing. That relationship you can build with the college university in your area and working with those because those networks are massive and they have such great connections. Thank you for doing that. Um, I think that's I, I um I can I can weigh in a little bit on this. Um at Harpeth Hall, we're very fortunate because of this winter term that's developed over the past 50 years that we actually have dedicated staff who research and identify potential internship opportunities for our students. And I I recognize that is not necessarily, I mean, you can't just go out there and be like, hey, head of school, we need to hire someone whose entire full-time job is finding internships for kids. That's unrealistic. I realize that. But um, but a thing that has worked at other institutions where I have, um, where I've worked before Harpeth Hall um, is tapping a parent network um, that often can, it, it, parents feel useful, which is something that uh, at some times of the year, we, we like them to be. Um, and they, they uh, are also often very welcoming for um, the age group that we're talking about, because that's a, that's a thing that I, I think people run up against quite often is that, um, that 15, 16, 17 year old uh, students are not the most welcome internship, intern group, age group. Um, uh, I loved Jose's idea of using college career uh, career centers, community college career centers are also a really good resource and are often open um, to high school students coming in and, and, and utilizing them. And then somebody mentioned Teen Life. I got my I got my Teen Life uh, brochure. Um, that that's another that's another resource that that I use quite often. All right, so we're closing in on the end. I want to leave a little bit of time for a more earnest Q and A. So I'll end our formal questioning with this. Long ago, community service was the thing. Then came the international coach bus service trips. And then what has followed in recent years is the influx of entrepreneurial endeavors. And lately, we've been seeing that these passion projects, proof and the questions from the, the group, these passion projects are cropping up as the thing to do to help your college admissions chances. How do we as counselors break this cycle of asking students to create more and more impressive resumes than some of us would even be able to achieve as adults. Because I know when I'm looking at my students' resume, I'm getting intimidated that they're going to push me out of a job like yesterday. I don't know, uh, honestly, what we do. Um, I know... And this may be a little infuriating to keep to some for me to keep saying, but I, I I mean, I know the number one thing that in selection processes, what people are looking for is authenticity. So, um, you know, just being a kid, being your kid self is probably the most authentic thing you can be, but that doesn't really solve the problem. One thing I would, I would like to see, and I hope to see in the future coming from universities is, is more transparency about how they do make judgments of, about um, you know experiential learning programs and how that plays into the admissions decision. I think we've made progress and uh, have done all, quite a bit to be transparent in terms of 
uh, academic qualifications, but we're a little bit lagging when it comes to the other things that are important. I'll touch on that a little bit. Um, with that, um, Steve, I, there is a movement going right now to be very transparent in this among lots of the newer, yeah. I say the, 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 the new realm coming up or the new regime coming up right now. I'm very fortunate. Um, I'm in the circles that I'm in. Um, uh, one person that comes to mind that is the, like kind of a forefront for that is Femi Ogalawa who is the uh, associate vice chair at UC Berkeley for admissions. Um, he is a person that is, you know, thriving for that, is pushing for that um, in the sense of like just the transparency, the openness to let them know, hey, this is what it means, everything of that nature. And you're seeing more of that. I think SCOTUS, the SCOTUS decision has, because people want more transparency, you're seeing that um, Janet and me are in the sim similar circles that we know these people. Um, another person that will come to mind is Calvin Weiss, the deputy dean of admissions at John Hopkins University, is a voice and a champion of this. Um, I, I I give hope. I give hope that this is happening more and more now. I think you're seeing that because we want to be. I, I speak for myself too, and um, and I speak for my vice president Gil Nueva, who has over thirty years of experience all over the nation at different institutions. Um, Transparency, honesty is key because we need to be as honest as possible. So I say this, there is hope and there is a trend going right now. Good. Hey, well, that's and good to hear. I, I, would, I would just add that um, that it, wor it works both ways. Yes, uh, as a college counselor, we can um, complain that the, 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 the motivation is coming from the college side that that students just keep adding more and more like they need to because the, there's this end goal in mind. But we also have to start when they're in the younger grades at our institutions talking about the importance of balance. And th as I mentioned earlier, the importance of fitting your college choice to you, who you are, your authentic self, as Steve said, rather than trying to mold yourself into some shape that you think will be a good fit for a particular college. Um, and so uh, I, I just I just encourage everyone to engage in conversation about balance. If if you see that students are lean, we we've we've undertaken this repeatedly at institutions where I've worked and are are in conversation about it right now at Harpeth Hall, um, it, talking about how to encourage balance in curricular choice, how to encourage encourage balance in in extracurricular choice. Um, and thereby hopefully create some understanding that it will be all right. <laughs> and uh, it, so it needs to work both ways. We can't just criticize the colleges and universities for putting pressure on us. We're feeding the beast if we keep pushing students to do more. Um, and, and so I try, I try very hard and sometimes fail, but try very hard to uh, always talk about balance with my students and make sure that they're they're taking care of themselves first and um, and not always putting the end result of college uh, first in their mind because because truly you know with no offense at all meant to Jose it's not the end result it's just four more years <laughs> and the end result is is much much longer. Well, thank you. Um, so Jose is going to have to step off of the Q and A. Um, he clearly has places to be as he's been all over campus already. Um, so thank you, Jose. And at this point, we'd like to open it up to some Q&A if there's any lingering questions that we haven't had a chance to get to. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Again, any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thanks, Jose. Thanks. Uh, there were one or two questions in the chat or the Q&A that I didn't get to, but um, one was, where colleges don't accept rec letters and student writing, um, specifically probably a UC, um, how do they get these things across? Um, and since we lost our college person, um, I'll jump in. I've I've been a reader for the UCs for almost, or for UCLA for seven or so years. Um, the personal insight questions are the mechanism by which students can share that and highlight the and quantify really the the accomplishment, whether it's that they're the only student who is working in a lab with all graduate students, or if they are the only teenager doing an internship with a company or shadowing 
Um, highlighting it in the personal insight question is really key to getting that message across, especially since the UCs frequently and um, consistently do have outside readers. That's a chance to add context because there's no one person reading for your school in those cases. And would a more robust extracurricular activities like internships help offset a mediocre ACT or SAT at an elite admissions or an elite admissions highly selective? I don't, I mean, I, I can't speak from personal experience. I can speak from what I've, I've heard. Um, I would say that it really depends. Uh, it depends on the institution and their flexibility uh, in, 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 you know, being flexible on, on whether or not a student doesn't meet a certain metric. Um, I certainly believe, like, you can expect that those that are more flexible, um, they would look to a broader array of like, okay, well, maybe the student is not meeting the metric in terms of the standardized tests, but they have other things that they can bring to, to the, the college or university. So, um, I think it certainly, ha it, it could offset that, but there are going to be a lot of limitations and it's going to be really hard for, uh, like a, a student or even like their academic advisor to really navigate going about that, like being uh, intentional in that process. So um, I, I guess my point is just to be wary of trying to be a little bit, um, to be, I don't want to say man manipulative, and that's not the word, but, uh, you know, <clears throat> thinking about it in, in terms of that clear cut, if, well, if my score is too low, I can do other things. Like it, it doesn't often translate that way in my personal experience from hearing from admissions officers. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, the question was, can it offset? Sure, maybe, <laughs> but it also might not. <laughs> um, uh, I feel like it, it's often the case in my student population that a student who has not done particularly well on standardized testing has done really great stuff in other aspects of their, mm -hmm. of their either co-curricular, extracurricular, uh, or academic life. And, and so I think then it's sort of incumbent on us as, as counselors to advocate for them in, in different ways and, and encourage them to advocate for themselves in different ways. If the scores aren't there or are, are not strong, then highlighting those things that they have done that that's it's I mean it's essentially it's the best that we can do right and then it's it's mm -hmm. a bit of a roll of the dice how it will be received but yeah well we are at the top of the hour and we've run out of time and I'm sure many of you who need to get to lunch and quickly take your restroom breaks and the moments you have left for your day um, but thank you all for joining us we always appreciate you tuning in for these webinars. We're always eager to get ideas on new topics. And I just want to put in a little bit of a plug. We do have a loose framework for our February episode, which we'll be sharing out in the weeks to come. But we're going to be unpacking the data behind some of our college counseling platforms like SCORE and um, Naviance and Maya, because we want to look at the data reliability that lives behind that as we're seeing changes in the data that goes into it and the data that we need to take out of it. So we're excited to be in the planning stages of that and hope that you'll join us for that when it's released. And um, again, the webinar will be posted to the Access YouTube page within a few days of um, finishing up. And for those that registered, you should also get an email with that. So thanks, everybody. And Good luck out there with the junior family meetings. Bye. -bye.